How is the European cloud and edge market going to look like by the end of the decade? Wouldn't we like to know? So without any further ado, I would like to invite uh, our panelists uh, to discuss this topic, to let us know also uh, which gaps in research and innovation will require additional EU funding in coming years to make it happen. So I would like to uh, call to the stage Andrew Adams, Deputy Director of the Center for Business Information Ethics at Meiji University. Welcome to the stage, Andrew. Please, a round of applause. <laughs> Uh, now, I would also like to invite uh, Ana Juan Ferrer. Uh, she's the program officer at DigiConnect, the European Commission, a person we value uh, her opinion so much at this project. She's leading us quite well. Thank you, Ana. <laughs> uh, next one is uh, Giacomo Inques, senior innovation consultant at Martel Innovate and leader of the Cloud Edge IoT Working Group at the Impace project. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Uh, then we have uh, Valentin Steinhauer. He is the deputy head of the EU representation at Deutsche Telekom, uh, but also chair of the Network Innovation Task Force at Etno. Welcome, Valentin. <laughs> and then the last panelist, but not least, is Tobias Edman. Uh, he's deputy head of the EU representation. Uh, well, this is the copy paste, I guess. But a uh, person from Rice, he's uh, our coordination program. Yeah. And the person to lead this interesting and quite relevant discussion, it's Giovanni Rimassa. He's the Chief Innovation Officer at Marta Illumit. Giovanni, please take the stage. Yeah. Yeah. So you can speak here. Yeah. Thank you. Good, thank you, Daniel, for the nice introduction. Thanks, everyone, that is still here and interested in, in uh, the, this last uh, uh, panel that is not the last session but feels already a little bit uh, of kind of beginning to wrap up these two days because that's why we uh, have this uh, look at the future, okay? So um, you have heard already the introduction, the, the presentation of the panelists, but uh, I would like to start uh, with, uh, by giving them, uh, uh, you know, it is said that it's very difficult to do predictions, especially about the future. So we, nobody of us can, can nail what will be the most important aspect of the future of the computing continuum. That's why it would be nice to start by hearing from each of you in your own perspective, very interest, what is the angle, if you want, that you, that you see in the, in the next steps, in the near future of the computing continuum. I would like to start uh, with you, Anna, first. And uh, of course, uh, we have heard uh, several things in these two days about the, the research program of Horizon Europe in this area. And uh, what I would like to, 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 to know from you is what you think will be the next uh, uh, role of, for example, uh, uh, edge computing that we have also have heard from the observatory. Uh, how is edge moving in this uh, transformation of the computing continuum also in the optics of the next, uh, uh, let's say, uh, research plan for the commission in the, at least in, in the ending of the Horizon Europe program? Mm -hmm. um, there are, uh, in my view, crucial opportunities ahead for, for edge computing and, and the development of the continuum. Uh, one of them is, is, and you have been reading about this, I guess, about the digital infrastructures white paper and the role of edge computing in, in creating the future networks um, that together with cloud computing is expected to change and bring a, a and a kind of mixed ecosystem between computing technologies and, and communication technologies to the field. Um, this is one, one angle, and for sure um, we see more and more, uh, and you could see this uh, in the discussion from, from Manuel uh, yesterday, um, that uh, the need of uh, AI uh, compute capacity in Europe, and this, of course, uh, when we talk about super large language models as Gen AI and things like this, it's for cloud and HPC, but uh, also we will need to have um, capacity for the inference of these uh, models and also to do predictive AI and other 
kinds of AI, and here again we will have the edge as a or my interpretation, and I think it's quite general, that the edge will have a predominant uh, role into this. Thank you, Anna. I would like to move next to uh, Valentin, because another topic that we have heard, I think, in multiple panels, also in the connection of digital sovereignty yesterday, is the, let's say, um, convergence between, the, let's call it cloud edge IoT continuum, with the other uh, HPC and the most notably the uh, next generation telecommunications. So I would say even in your double role of a representative of a major telecom, European telecom provider, but also as a chair of the, of the network working group, um, what do you see are the next uh, challenges and opportunities uh, re related to this, uh, let's say, extension of the idea of seamless access and connectivity and, and also intelligent management? When, when, when the next generation telecommunications, also the current generation telecommunication, enter the picture. Thank you very much. Um, maybe I first take a little bit of a step backwards and look a bit at where we come from and then also say a bit on um, where we might be going next. Um, I think if we look at the past five years, and my background is not, not a technical one, more a policy background, so I've been here in Brussels and following a bit the discussions also with the Commission, um, and I think what we've seen is that there was a incredible push from the policy side, but also from the industry side on developing European alternatives, right? So we've seen Gaia-X, we've seen the Cloud Alliance, IPSI, many initiatives that have gone into the same direction. And I think if you look at the telecom sector, um, we've tried to be from the start part of these initiatives. Uh, if I speak for Deutsche Telekom, we've been founding member of Gaia-X, we've been, uh, we participate in the IPSI and the Cloud Alliance, because we believe that it's actually important to create these European alternatives. Um, and now what we see, um, also looking at the Commission's plans and um, at the uh, white paper that was published in February, for example, on, on digital infrastructure, we see that this uh, concept of convergence uh, becomes more important. And I think that it expresses also a bit what we see as a telecom operator on the network side, because we see on the network side that a lot of transformations are happening and are already ongoing. And I think if I would take a few examples, I think the main um, changes that we see is with, re with regard to cloudification. Uh, already for the past years we have been cloudifying our network, especially the core network, to a large extent. Now this is increasingly moving to the access part, um, but we also see other technology trends like uh, network disaggregation that also brings new architecture um, and new concepts to it that in um, that together with, the, uh, with cloudification moves us closer, I think, towards the, the cloud way of working. So we're going a bit away from the traditional telecom, special purpose hardware world to the cloud world. And I think that is a bit captured by this concept of convergence and I think it's an important uh, concept because it helps to also understand where the role of telecom operators will be in enabling this continuum, these applications that we talk about, um, and of course also when we talk about AI, trying to enable with the infrastructure uh, what comes next. And I think that's, that's an important part. Um, now, maybe just focusing a bit on the next steps, what I see as, uh, as challenges also from a telecom operator perspective. I think one of the key challenges would be to bring all of this together because we have so many initiatives that I already mentioned um, that are already ongoing looking at different aspects of the continuum, be it the telco cloud stack, be a reference architecture, there's so many pieces and I think one of the key challenges will really be to bring this together uh, focus on interoperability of the different technical solutions that we're working on um, and uh, potentially also think about me measures like a technical screening committee that kind of helps to bring together these different initiatives and ensures that there is interoperability between the different technical solutions. Um, second, I think also what would be key is to look at the demand side from the beginning. So to look at demand and supply, of course, we have to look at how we build this infrastructure, but I think it's crucial also to look from the beginning at uh, how can you um, demonstrate use cases to make it commercially viable? I think that would be also critical. And last point, uh, and it has been mentioned already a lot of time, um, a lot of times, I think AI would be critical. We see a lot of movements now um, already from hyperscalers. I think every two weeks you have a different, um, different report on investments. Only this week, I think it was BlackRock, Microsoft, 30 billion um, infrastructure fund for AI and cloud. Uh, you can name it. Also in Europe, so many announcements. And I think it's the right time to also think in Europe about what do we need to do to enable the digital infrastructure that we need 
for what is coming next also in terms of AI. And I think what is, of course, from our perspective important is that we look both at the com compute side of things, but also at the network side. And I think looking at this jointly, this is a bit what I understand under convergence a little bit. So I, uh, I'm very positive about this. And I think it's, um, it's the right, right time to look at this jointly. Thank you. I would like to go next with Tobias. And uh, so we started with the edge computing and then with the convergence with telecommunication, but uh, uh, there is even more if you want in the vision of computing continuum and the resources that could be available in Europe. And so I wanted to ask you about uh, the uh, connection with, for example, uh, satellite use for observation, data acquisition, HPC, and all the, the, this additional, let's say, um, aspect of the convergence and maybe hopefully with the, of the future of the computing continuum. Uh, th thank you very much, and I think it's really, really interesting now. I'm, I mean, we are trying at RISE, the computer science department, working both, both with HPC, pushing the border on that side, but also working, going into edge in space and how, and how that should be incorporated. And I think that what I've seen now with 6G coming, it's that this makes it real, much more interesting, both for the te telecom operators and for the tech providers like Ericsson, but also for Swedish uh, innovation finance, financial institutions, which, so I think this is go going to be some kind of a game changer, or might be a game changer at least, that is, everything is connected together, and then, then of course it's important that we build things that actually include the edge in space as well, when we're looking at the edge cloud continuum, mm -hmm. and also to see that the compute that we are doing, if it's really, really heavy, that we, it shouldn't be too difficult to move it from one source to another, like an HPC facility, for example, if that's what's needed. So I would say that we have an expanding continuum. That's my, my take. Yep, fair enough. I can't disagree. Uh, and then for you, uh, Andrew, uh, I would say I would ask you to you know, help us have a fresh look in two ways at least. One is that uh, uh, we already kind of uh, went through the various technological areas, but I would like to hear from you also what is your take on the future of computing continuum also from a point of view of uh, all the non-technical issues like uh, ethical, social impact, and so on. The second aspect where I expect some fresh look from you is that you, of course, are a partner of Nexus Forum, but you are in the uh, uh, non-European uh, affiliation of the major university, so as a new European uh, researcher in, in, in a Japanese institution, uh, it's also, I think, something that would be, will bring uh, you know, diversity and richness to our conversation. Okay, so thank you very much. The first I want to briefly go into history, as, as Valentin said, but a little bit further back than that, and look at how we got here. And I think that's a key element of looking where we're going, not just the next five years, but the next 10 to 15 years, is how we got here. Um, and we must take into account things such as the future of privacy and the other social impacts, is to look at the drivers for the dominance of the hyperscalers. And one of the things I, I, I was struck by this, this week is that we keep talking about the, the, uh, the loss of market share in the European cloud sector. Um, but we're ignoring the fact that actually this is the same in America. It just happens that these are three American companies, but they are also dominant in America. Um, and that dominance in America, of course, gives them economies of scale that allows them to help their dominance in Europe, but they are also dominant in America. Um, and I'm not sure that it is to, to a great extent, all these things people talk about, I mean, the, the freedom to innovate and things like that, that are necessarily the primary drivers of that. In America, Microsoft is dominant in office productivity and has been for a long time. Now we can argue about why and how that happened, but that's a, that's a fact. Cloud adoption is driven to a great extent in a number of companies by the first thing they try is office productivity on the cloud. Who are you gonna go with if you're going to do office productivity on the cloud? It's going to be Microsoft. The other two, Google and Amazon have two of the world's largest sets of infrastructures for their own core business, their own business of e-commerce and search and related services. That gives them an economy of scale that nobody else is going to get to, not without 
somebody else coming in and challenging. Now, you mentioned the Japanese aspect. In Japan, there is a, an Amazon-alike company. Um, Amazon is the biggest e-commerce company in Japan, but it's not as dominant as it is in many other countries. We have a, a homegrown company called Rakuten, which has some international operations, but is not as uh, um, internationally active as Amazon is. But they take probably 80% of the same of um, the uh, the size of Amazon in Japan um, is Rakuten. So they have about a 30% market share compared to Amazon's 40% market share. Now they haven't gone into the cloud services the way Amazon have done. But I think that's the sort of company that might challenge Amazon in that respect. But what we do see is that for the future potentials, it's we've got to look at where are the opportunities to compete with the next wave? Not try and beat these guys at their own game. We're not going to be able to do it. Not without changing the game. So there might be some things like, as I say, Rakuten in Japan um, might challenge Amazon for the Japanese market in cloud, potentially. Um, but what's most important in these areas is that we figure out what the opportunities are to look at what's coming next and make sure that we are setting companies up to be able to compete. Um, because Amazon and Google and Microsoft are not going to have the same um, opportunities to dominate in, for example, edge computing. Um, Apple might come out. And again, you've got economies of scale and deep pockets. Apple, with its diverse ecosystem of their own cloud offerings and the uh, um, uh, desktop computing and smartphones is somebody who might look at the edge computing um, and might be somebody we've got to be worried about becoming the next Amazon, Microsoft, etc. Um, and finally, on the on the social impact of these things, I think again, cloud. We have already with GDPR and the Digital Markets Act and Digital Services Act, we've already moved to try the best we can to draw the sting of the abuses in those areas. These are, these are not perfect, but they have made great strides, and we now need to really push forward the, the proper implementation of these. But we've got to look at things such as edge computing and the broader continuum and AI, and what the threats that those are bringing. But they also bring opportunities, and we need to be looking a bit more about saying, how can we push for the opportunities of these things, such as, Edge gives you huge potential for privacy enhancing technologies where things which used to have to be done on the cloud, which meant they had to gather all the data into the center. We can now do things such as look for where people are in visual um, surveillance, process what's going on on the edge. Where it's not a problem, elide it. Mm -hmm. and only show there was a person or a vehicle or an object there, but not what it was. And then that data, which is what's needed for the broader AI consideration, can be sent to the cloud. Um, that's where I think we mm -hmm. should be looking, is how can we leverage these things to do better social impact? Okay. Thank you, um, Andrew, and thanks everyone already for this first round. We already see that there is quite a bit of, uh, of uh, diversity, and uh, with uh, Giacomo I would like to finish the round by uh, considering the aspect of uh, uh, international cooperation beyond Europe. Right? You showed up in the, in the panel in the presentation before with the in-pace project, so beyond uh, Japan and the other Indo-Pacific uh, countries that are important, please give us also this perspective that goes a little bit beyond our borders. Yes, I'm, I'm very happy to be after uh, Andrew and after his, uh, his comment because I think if you look in the future in the perspective, it's, it's very good to look in another direction, maybe not <laughs> west, east maybe. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy that with this initiative of the commission, I mean uh, in PACE namely, because it, it allows us to really study what's going on and go on site and see what's, uh, what's happening. And we are also required by the Commission to be uh, practical rather than uh, you know, theoretical. So we, we already started our, our, our desk research, as I was saying, there will be this analysis coming on. But for example, just to mention a, 
an overview. So what, what's happening in, in Japan is this strategy of smart nation that is, is touching uh, four points like AI, cybersecurity, IoT, and data analytics, which is something that we have been discussing before. And if you move to South Korea, uh, it's, it's the same. You know, AI, AI semiconductor, 5G, 6G, quantum, metaverse, which is something that we haven't discussed here, but it, it can be an enabling factor, so a use case where all these technologies are put in place and that somebody can use it to, com I mean, some users are really there maybe for that. And I know there is also another initiative of, of the commission on the um, virtual worlds and uh, internet of the future, which could be a complementary to what we are doing uh, in, in, in here. And well, just in Japan, I, by your studies, so we have this strategy of the society 5.0. So where the human is, is put in the place and all the services are around. And uh, yesterday we heard that GaiaX is already having some a pilot project towards this direction of the, if I'm not wrong, was the digital identity. So I mean, all this collaboration are, are important and I've, I'm a man of a collaboration. So I believe in the ecosystem creation and knowledge sharing to, because if you look at the thing always from the same perspective, you miss something. Now maybe like moving outside, the comfort zone outside Europe and looking at these countries that are, some of them are more advanced in some aspects, some others are in others. And maybe in other aspects, Europe is more advanced. So with this dialogue, uh, we can get something for the next five to 10 years maybe. Thank you, Giacomo. Uh, so we, after this, let's say wide, uh, you know, uh, collection of, of, of perspectives uh, before uh, opening the floor because of course we like the other session we'd also like to to hear from the audience uh, I would like to ask you now in I mean uh, again in turn to uh, give uh, a, let's say short uh, and uh, and um, personal take on uh, the role of artificial intelligence. Okay, not because anybody doubts that it's not important, but because there are so many ways in which we can, it can be important that I would like to hear what angle you think would be the most important uh, that you want to highlight in terms of how, uh, in which ways will AI be important in the future of computing continuum, okay? So maybe in this case, I would start again from you, uh, Anna, and then I go just around the round. It maybe it could be really important in as a way of uh, driving the demand for for computational power. So both at the edge and at the club. So this is in my view the, okay, the main okay, role. Okay, very good. As a demand for for evolution of infrastructure, also multi multi tiered. Okay, very good. Yeah, from my perspective, um, doesn't exist any AI without data, which seems obvious. But that's, uh, for me, is the central point of AI. So um, having enough data, the right data to train the AI and in all the different aspects of the cloud continuum, like from the devices to the cloud to, to the data of the consumers and users. So like situated AI and that can adapt to the data, like uh, Andrew was saying, that maybe you, you can delete the data locally because you learn what you need to learn. So this yeah. kind of uh, multifaceted uh, presence of AI. In yeah, the also okay. if you think about generative AI, so it's powered by data. So okay. if you don't have this data, you don't have generative AI. So that's it. Clear, thanks. I, th I think I would uh, very much agree with what Anna said. I think. Um, maybe two perspectives. I think the one perspective is definitely the demand driver, um, uh, helping us to also commercializing some of these uh, offerings that we want to bring or the, the infrastructure that we want to provide. Um, especially if we talk about how do we generate value in Europe um, with AI, I think it's about uh, bringing it into the application. Um, and then we're talking about SMEs, about the wider economy. Uh, and then we're talking about Edge Cloud because uh, potentially you have applications there, industrial metaverse, digital twins, that will require low latency uh, compute and that will require distributed infrastructure. So I think it's critical really for, for driving demand. Uh, and the second perspective maybe is also, of course, we can use AI um, in building that infrastructure, right? Um, that's what we do in our networks um, where it's already implemented in in various functions. And I think we will see this more going forward, especially when we talk about 
um, how the infrastructure will also become more complex because we have to orchestrate more elements, uh, for example, satellite, uh, non-terrestrial, terrestrial infrastructure. Um, so there will be more complexity, and I think there um, orchestration, integration will become more and more important, and I think there AI can also help to automate things and manage that complexity. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I also agree that I think AI will be paramount in this. I mean, it will be driving the why to do the computes. It will be a driving factor for having, uh, having the edge, uh, edge nodes and the continuum. So it will be living on that. And uh, then, of course, it will be used to form the compute continuum, I would say, so for orchestration, etc. I think there is an interesting venue if you start having edge learning and you have models that diverge in different ways from each other, from a common foundation model, for example, and uh, how that will evolve. It, I, I think that's a bit... Uh, well, I don't know if it's under research, actually, but I think it's really interesting to see what will happen if you have a lot of, lot of models, and then you have a lot of edge learning, and then uh, some models perform better in some areas, etc. So you will have a sort of diversity of models from the same source. It will be become evolutionary developing in some sense. You, you mean the same system or system of systems, right? That you would have more than one uh, large model? Yes. Because you, it would be I, yes, in different contexts and so on. Yes, and the, the, at, if, if you have edge learning, then the, the models will start to diverge a bit, and some of them will perform better in certain cir circumstances, and will learn that and continue doing that. So you will sort of have a, a diversity of models from the same base, which of course means that you don't really know what you get when you, when you send your data into the system and get an answer back, because it can be that you get something that is locally performing better locally. Yeah, clear, thanks. Andrew? So, to insert a note of pessimism, um, I think that AI has been recently overhyped. Um, I think the current enthusiasm for AI everywhere is heading us for a fall. Um, there are various aspects to this. I think that the assumption that AI will solve many of the problems that we have in the economy, in society, in climate, um, is leading us to ignore better ways to deal with some of these issues. Um, in particular because the particular models that have emerged from AI in recent years are very good in the small scale um, when they have targeted data, but often fail when they reach the boundaries of that small scale. And I worry very much that these small scale successes are leading us down a path where we're going to incorrectly apply them. And with the lack of explainability with some but not all of the AI approaches, that we will not actually realize that first we're going down suboptimal routes until we go down some disastrous routes. Um, and so while I am a technophile and um, a techno-optimist in some respects, um, I do worry that we're going to see a, an over-usage of AI beyond its capabilities. Um, and in, in some particularly in some economic sectors, we're going to see people think, oh, I can get rid of a lot of experienced staff and just rely on the AI. And then, or they're going to say, well, the AI can do all the low-level stuff and I can rely on my senior staff to, to do the, the detail stuff. And then in three to five years' time, they're going to realize, oh, we no longer have any junior staff who can replace the senior staff who want to move on. Um, or that we're going to find that actually all the stuff we got rid of, they were doing a job that was necessary and that the world has changed and we can no longer adapt because the AI was based on previous data and is no longer valid. So I do worry about some of these very broad statements about AI in these areas. Yep. 
that's a very legitimate concern, I think, also widely shared. Um, I would like to see if there is uh, some uh, intervention from the audience, and if so, I would also ask you to uh, also have questions for the panelists, so um, if you can have uh, both uh, your take or, and the uh, questions that you are interested in. Okay, yes, I see there in the, at the, the bottom. Can, does someone have a microphone, or uh, this is the first section where there's no microphones in the stage? Because, sorry, okay, so I, I apologize. So <laughs> thank you, Francesco. <laughs> Right. Um, my um, concern or question regards if we think forwards and we think about you know, the climate goals we've set, how that relates to our visions of ever-decreasing demand for compute and all that and how, yeah, how these two relate to each other since there is such an enormous energy consumption needed for all this compute. Very general question, but I was very interested to hear what the panel thinks of this. Yep, who wants to? My understanding uh, is that uh, any evolution on, on compute will have to be looking for optimization of the energy consumed for uh, specifically on the topic of AI processing. Because, um, I don't know, it's clear, um, of course, it will end up being as as trendy as we think today or not, but we, we cannot really say today, but it seems that the computational needs, uh, there is a common agreement that the computational needs uh, are uh, growing super significantly. And, and for sure, we will not be able to afford to, and probably there won't be the energy sources to, to sustain uh, you know, uh, the energy needed at the same pace. So uh, uh, it's, it's going to be part of the evolution of these technologies that they, they are much more optimal in, in terms of how the data is consumed, more optimal in using renewable energy. So, so there, I understand that part of the technology evolution will be towards uh, becoming more sustainable uh, in terms of ecologic terms, trends and so on. I don't know if any Yeah, I think the, uh, it is a very good point. Um, this is a potential market failure, but not a market failure in what you might think. I worry that the consumption of power from these demands is going to be a driver of the price of electricity in particular being driven up and that this is going to have the concomitant effect of driving things like inflation. And I think we need to be cognizant of the fact that the, there are a set of economic levers in the uh, energy sector that the regulators from the EC and the member states and other states need to be very concerned about um, avoiding just treating these as, a, as though they are a normal um, part of the market. We have examples of how we've dealt with this in the past with big energy intensive industries. So uh, energy intensive industries such as steel production have been treated differently um, in terms of energy um, at times. And we need to think about this and this is going to be something the regulators need to think about is to say, okay, you need to use energy when there isn't demand um, and in places where there isn't demand. Um, rather than just treating it as a single, completely flat market, because it's not. If you allow me, just, uh, just um, an example of things that, uh, that could be happening, and it is just a smaller example. There is in, in France, if I'm not mistaken, a company called Carnot, this company is is putting data centers in the in the basement of the of the buildings, and all the heating is is taking advantage for for the heat for the building itself. It is just a super small. It's an example of what it could be happening. You know, it's it's just something 
in the direction of developments that we could be seeing in the coming years to make this, uh, this trade-off that you were saying or the need for right balance uh, happening, in my personal view, at least. Yes, and um, first, we actually at RISE, we have a data center where we research in how to use the energy, the leftover energy, and how to make the cooling as efficient as possible, actually. And then today I read that uh, they're restarting one of the Harrisburg reactors in the US, and it's going to go solely to Microsoft, the energy. Thank you. Uh, yes, and uh, what I can add also to what uh, Anna said, that uh, companies like Carnot, but there are also research projects like Cognets before that are trying to do this multi-criteria optimization. So I think there is good awareness that now you need to optimize, orchestrate, deploy the, the workloads, considering also energy consumption, energy provenance, because you know the carbon footprint, if it's renewable, is not uh, important. Uh, but the problem is, I mean, very far from being solved. Uh, are there uh, any other intervention <coughs> requests, or please, yeah. Yeah, well, for the energy, I think you've said enough. I would like to introduce another potential, uh, say, problem for the future, because uh, we have been discussing uh, many times about cybersecurity aspects, you know, which is very important, of course, for regular kind of threats. But these uh, uh, dependencies that we are creating more and more, no, the, cloud uh, usage is increasing uh, and uh, the cloud uh, services are now pervasive, huh? could also introduce uh, some additional threats for the future. No? Suppose that uh, for some reason uh, the cloud uh, infrastructure collapses. Or suppose that we have uh, a pandemic of uh, new viruses uh, within uh, all these artificial intelligence that are running on the cloud uh, uh, edge uh, continuum. Uh, what will happen to our economies and what will happen to our activities? Huh? How can we be more prepared to these uh, situations? Uh, how can create a cloud edge continuum which is more resilient to this kind of extreme events that are not captured by, uh, say, the regular cybersecurity activities? Huh? Uh, thank you. Uh, I would just say belt and suspenders, belt and braces for the British, uh, but please, so this resilience, right? So anyone wants to take, or wants to take the topic on uh, resilience or expected resilience of future cloud continuum uh, uh, infrastructure? Well, I mean, not to just repeat what you said, but a diverse ecosystem is the first thing we need. One of the issues that we've seen, again, looking back a bit at, at uh, cybersecurity history, one of the issues we had in the 90s and the 2000s was the monoculture of Microsoft um, was that it led to a deep um, vulnerability um, in systems. So if you have diversity in your systems, you are less vulnerable to a complete collapse. Um, and so we must be careful of saying that you know, don't everyone go for what seems like the single optimized solution. We need some diversity um, for a, a number of reasons, but one of them is the cybersecurity reason, to avoid um, what we've seen a couple of times with um, critical infrastructure errors, sometimes um, pure error, sometimes um, apparently quite sophisticated hacks. Um, if we have diversity in that, we're, we're more robust. Thank you. Any other takes? Good. Oh, yeah, please. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Well, first of all, maybe in addition to the uh, sustainability question, at this moment there's a race ongoing for the gigawatt scale data centers. Uh, Amazon already has one. That's a nuclear power plant and a data center next to it. So that's and carbon free. So that's uh, everything. It takes all the boxes. Eh? Um, but I have another question. Um, DeepMind predicts that in 2028 we will have artificial general intelligence. Elon Musk says it will be 29. Um, nobody has been talking about this disruption, I think, because if you have this and we create um, uh, regulation here in Europe, Elon Musk could just order a number of artificial lawyers and well, try to fight it, which is going to cost us a lot of money 
to defend ourselves against the bots and, and, and the artificial intelligence by Elon Musk. So is there any idea of what we can do here in Europe to deal with this evolution which will probably eventually arrive here too? Uh, uh, yeah, okay, go, go ahead. <laughs> I'll say that. Um, AGI is not coming by 2029. Um, as someone whose technical background was in um, theorem proving, I still have a lot of connections in the general area of how AI is going. Um, the developments in machine learning, which is what most people refer to as AI now, and that includes large language models, are outside the brains of certain people who, are, um, who don't understand the technology, and I include Elon Musk in that, um, are not anywhere near artificial consciousness, which is what we're really talking about with Gen AI. We will see advances in what we've got, but the idea that we're suddenly going to see an emergence of a, uh, an AI which is artificially sentient within the next five years from the directions in which we're traveling is a pipe dream. Um, it's far more likely that what we're going to see is the misuse, going back a little bit more to the cybersecurity, is the misuse as access to more sophisticated AI models gets cheaper and easier. Um, we're likely to see more misuse of models and it's the humans with evil intent with powerful tools at their disposal that we need to be much more concerned about than the emergence of Skynet. And I speak as a big science fiction yeah. fan um, <laughs> and uh, you know, I'm aware of the, uh, the, the, the apocalyptic um, statements. Um, we're not getting Gen AI, a, a general, Sorry, AGI, AGI yeah. artificial general intelligence within five years. Um, we're probably not getting it within 15 years. Um, at some point we probably will, but the level of sophistication we need and the understanding of what we need and, and the way to get there is no, we're nowhere near it yet. Thank you. I, mean, I agree with Andrew, but I also have to make like a sobering remark that it wouldn't be the first time that a false belief creates a lot of trouble. So just because AGI is not coming soon doesn't mean that we don't have to face problems by people that think it is. But I agree from that point. I also think that we are running out of time, right? Okay. So I would like to thank, uh, thank all the panelists and thank the public again for your very nice and uh, insightful uh, participations. And uh, uh, I just, I'm very happy now to hand over to, to Daniel for the presentation of the closing keynote. Thanks very much to all of you. Thank you.